adquirir Okay, I am now unmuted, so we need to leave it that way. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, so here we go. Um, good evening, I am Joan Johnson, City Librarian and Director of the Milwaukee Public Library, and welcome to our program on Combating Online Hatred, a conversation with author Talia Laban. I, I want to extend a very warm welcome to tonight's guest, Talia Laban, whose interview I heard on an NPR program in November, 2020. It was a riveting conversation, and so I was thrilled when I heard that we had an opportunity to host her. It is in keeping with our mission here at Milwaukee Public Library to bring important programming like this to our community. While we can't wait to welcome everyone back into our buildings for in-person events, we are so pleased to have our guests and all of you joining us virtually this evening. Now, a brief introduction before I turn it over to our guests. Talia Laban is a freelance journalist focusing on the far right with bylines in the New Republic, The Village Voice, GQ, Vice, The Washington Post, and many more. She is the author of the recent book, Culture Warlords, My Journey into the Dark Web of White Supremacy. Ms. Laban is joined by Ellie Gettinger, Education Director at Jewish Museum Milwaukee who will be conducting the interview this evening. Ms. Gettinger works to build understanding of diverse topics from immigration to the Holocaust, to Jewish community, to different populations, from preschool to older adults, for Jews and non-Jews. Ms. Gettinger, thank you for being here tonight. I will now turn it over to you to get our discussion started. Thank you so much, Joan. I'm so excited to be at the library. Um, does everything sound okay? Yeah? No, it, now it does. It was a little off. Uh, um, and Talia, I'm really excited to be interviewing you in, you know, this very intimate uh, space um, and to be able to really explore this fascinating book. For those of you who have not read it, it's right here, Culture Warlords, um, uh, My Journey Up, Upside Down, yeah, into the Dark Web of White Supremacy. This is a book that in the best possible way I'm saying this gave me nightmares. It was a really scary book to read. And part of that scariness is being scared for you, the author. Um, so I'd love to start out tonight with a little bit about your process and how you A, got into this work and then how you actually did the research that you documented within the book itself. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I just wanna say thanks so much. I've never actually uh, been to Milwaukee in person. Hope to someday for sure. So I'm excited to join you digitally for, for the time being. Um, and uh, the second uh, thing I wanted to say is, um, yeah, I mean, so it, it, I've been writing about the far right um, since 2017. Uh, and as I'm sure most of you know, um, in, in 2017, uh, th there, there was the catastrophic, horrible events in Charlottesville, Virginia um, that August. And that was a moment that really offended a lot of um, naive sort of assumptions I'd made about anti-Semitism or the lack of it in the United States, about a certain level of comfort in the American dream that I was feeling. Um, so I wrote my first piece a couple of months after that event about the neo-Nazi website, The Daily Stormer, and it struggled to find a stable web host. Um, I compared them to the wandering Jews, which they were, were not very pleased about. Um, and that was my first experience also of sort of the way when you gaze into that, this particular abyss, it, it gazes back at you emphatically and, and, and renders its, its judgment, especially as a Jewish woman, that's um, something they don't fear to, to render um, at all. And so I, uh, you know, but I'm a very stubborn person. I'm difficult to, to scare off. And, uh, you know, the more they retaliated or, you know, uh, 
enacted that kind of, you know, anti-Semitic, misogynistic, fat phobic abuse that they love to engage in, um, the more fascinated I became. And so I've been writing on the subject for various publications for a number of years and, uh, you know, decided to put it all in a book, um, this book, um, which I, I'm holding upside down again, um, yeah, this book. Um, We're going to say the coded message or something. No, no, no. Um, the coded message is I should have drank more coffee today. <laughs> no, um, but so the book is, it's, it's, a, it's a mix of sort of traditional journalism and history and what you might call gonzo or stunt journalism. Um, you know, there's a long proud tradition of women stunt journalists like Nellie Bly, the famous journalist who got herself locked up in an insane asylum to report on the conditions and uh, several of her peers were less well known. Um, so if I have to be called a stunt journalist, I'll put myself comfortably in their shoes and, and with that august heritage. Um, but essentially what I did was um, a little bit of catfishing. <laughs> I spent a long time um, on an all white dating site um, under a fake name and, and photo. Um, I had the various men, it was very gender imbalanced. Various men write love letters to their ideal white wife and printed them in my book. Um, I uh, spent some time on a chat for U European and American white supremacists, wound up catfishing a Ukrainian neo-Nazi into revealing his real name to me, which I then got published. Um, you know, but it was a pretty delicate operation over the course of five months. <laughs> um, and then much more of the book was more just eavesdropping on neo-Nazi chats um, and websites and forums, um, many of which were concentrated on the encrypted chat app Telegram. Um, and so, you know, that forms, I guess, like the sexiest top line part of the story, but there's also a lot about the history of anti-Semitism, the role religion plays in, in hate groups, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so in thinking about this in the, you know, we see the social media, we see the world of social media and through these kinds of big, big platforms, things like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and certainly some of this exists in those places, or is it all at this point relegated to uh, these kinds of off platforms like Telegram or Parler? And is what, how did the two, how do these larger pieces of, you know, in terms of the bigger world of social media, YouTube, the, the, the giants work against what we're seeing in your book? And then how also are they supporting white supremacy? Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I have to say the, the, uh, um, the, the, by far the most common form of social media that white supremacists use is exactly the same ones that you and I do. Um, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. You know, they're absolutely present and endemic in all of these, uh, you know, in all of these platforms. Um, and while these social media companies have made various attempts to, uh, you know, call these populations, um, all of these, all of these have been relatively half-hearted <laughs> to my mind. I mean, um, you know, there's the question of, is it even possible to purge all the Nazis? But, uh, you know, can you keep up with their ever shifting coded language? But I would say that, you know, way, be way before you get to the question, is it possible? I think you, you have to ask, is a sincere effort being made, not just when sort of these companies are caught with their pants down by the press? And I think Absolutely not. <laughs> these are not good faith actors, these social media companies. Um, uh, and so, you know, I would say that, you know, these are by far the commonest uh, forms of social media in, on which uh, neo-Nazis and, you know, far right, far writers find themselves. That being said, there is a suite of sort of alternative social media services um, such as Gab, Minds, MeWe, the Walkie Talkie app, Zello, um, the uh, 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 the encrypted chat app, Telegram. Which um, you know, Telegram is an interesting app. It originated in Russia, um, 
and was and um, perhaps still is uh, a big hub for Russian opposition journalists and politicians. It enables you to have both public facing and private chats. Mm -hmm. And Pavel Dura, the founder, um, really pushed back very hard against Russian authorities that wanted to censor and even incarcerate uh, and persecute people who were using the app in Russia. However, in the West, uh, it's become just an absolute haven, I, you know, and in Russia and Ukraine as well. It's been an absolute haven for white supremacist thought. Um, and in the wake of January 6th and, and some crackdowns by platforms on sort of the more egregious conspiracy theories and a sort of violent sentiment that was being bandied around also become a home for some of the people whose sentiments might be associated with that event. Uh, I'll say that to avoid getting overtly uh, political. So um, the short answer is yes, they're everywhere you are. Like everywhere you're posting an update about your dog or your niece or your nephew, um, there is a white supremacist uh, connecting to others, posting radicalizing propaganda, and you know, particularly through the medium of these closed groups, um, really riling each other up, as well as the suite of complementary uh, social media um, apps and 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 sites that you know serve as a, as a forum for them to sort of be more open about their sentiments. Well. You describe in the book, you describe, and this was something that I like underlined and highlighted and was like, ah, this is when you're talking about combating online, um, online white supremacy, this feels like the real challenge here. You say the process of far right radicalization is real and widespread, and it rarely starts with overt Nazism. Average Americans tend to shun swastikas if only due to their historical associations. It takes a process of being exposed to and absorbing far-right ideas and then more and more of them to break down in person's inherent opposition to racism or misogyny or anti-Semitism. And I'm interested in what the on-ramps that you find most frequently are. Where's that starting point? What's the gateway drug of, of white supremacy um, in terms of the things that we should look out for for our kids, our neighbors, are you know, like, hey, is this something that they're really getting into? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And frankly, like, I don't have kids, especially not you know, teenage kids. And if I did, I think I'd be in a perpetual state of concern about what they might be being exposed to. Um, precisely because it rarely starts with Sig Heil videos or you know, stuff that I've seen, compilations of, you know, violence and murder against people of color, you know, um, these diatribes and, and manifestos about the superiority of the white race. That's really, that's an ending point, not a starting point. Um, and I'm gonna start with your Camp Auschwitz shirt. That's, that's like, when you get to there, you're like, yeah, yeah, that's fully that's, radicalized at this point. Exactly. Um, so radicalization is a process. It's often a quick process, um, you know, and it looks different for different kinds of extremism. Um, you know, many people unfortunately have stories of their parents or relatives being radicalized into the QAnon conspiracy theory, whose sort of watchword is do the research, do your own research. Mm -hmm. Looking there are a lot of different on-ramps into that, you know, from sort of crunchy yoga moms who start out with some anti-vaccination beliefs um, and then quickly come to believe in, in a global cabal of Jews and, and Satan, it's Satanists, you know, running the world and sucking the blood out of children, um, which is a belief that millions of your countrymen earnestly hold um, to neo-Nazis, like the ones that I stood to talk to, uh, to members of militias um, and, you know, a, a, other far-right groups at this point, I think there are groups that we talk about, like the Proud Boys, or, you know, we talk about uh, Patriot Front, you know, there are these organized groups, but that they're the exception. Mostly, mm -hmm. it's sort of this, the same sort of, like, tens to hundreds, like, it's very difficult to pin precise numbers, but it's more about, you have this radicalized population, and they sort of form into these kind of fraternities and bands and and are, are in this ongoing conversation um, 
you know, and in networks with each other. Um, and it's much less about forming formal groups, although those of course are easier to name and describe. But the process of radicalization, so I would say that, it, you know, as I've seen it and, and um, you know, on the all white dating site that I joined, there there was a uh, there was sort of a section for like how did you get red pilled, which is like how did you come to these these political beliefs about white uh, and many of them cited YouTube, um, uh, really a lot of them, majority. And then there's um, also there was an exhaustive analysis by the great website uh, Bellingcat um, that that talked at length like, about you know how did white supremacists cite their own sources of radicalization. And again and again, YouTube came up as probably the most common source. But again, you know, there are certainly channels that are overt Holocaust denial. There are certain, certainly channels that are overt anti-Semitism, uh, that are overt racism, that, are, you know, combine all of the three in a sort of potpourri of disgusting stuff. Um, but that's, again, rarely the starting point. So what, what you have, as far as the slippery slope goes. I mean, I'll just briefly, briefly go into it because I know we have lots to cover. Um, we do, but this the theory is- as I, The theory as I lay it out in the book is essentially what most people's path to radicalization looks like is taking advantage of the prejudices that are already endemic in our society. They're already just like incredibly present everywhere we are. So misogyny, transphobia, and homophobia, um, with trans misogyny in particular um, being a source of radicalization, and Islamophobia, um, as well as anti-Black racism, you know, uh, in that sort of coded, postly at water way we have of describing it. Um, and so very often, you know, you have these slickly produced very well-funded uh, channels, you know, right-wing channels um, that, you know, will essentially stoke the fires of these already extant prejudices. And these content creators very deliberately seek to foment a series of pretty universal emotions that a lot of people, including particularly the young white audience that they court, uh, have in spades, which is a sense of alienation, a sense of loss of purpose, a sense of loneliness, a sense of wanting to belong to something bigger or wanting to dedicate your life to something, uh, to a cause. All of us feel these things. I mean, you know, raise your hand if you've never felt lonely or you've never felt purposeless um, or you've never felt like you really wanna mean something in this world. Of course, these are universal sentiments. Um, but channeling those very natural and even laudatory human sentiments towards hate is a long and delicate process, but it starts with the idea that like, it, what I would describe it as is basically the process of saying the prejudices you hold, which are, you know, societally endemic, but particularly transphobia because it's, it's portrayed as so visceral in our society. Like, of course that should be gross you know, in the way that the gay panic was admitted um, for so long as a defense. Um, and um, uh, like, so they take advantage of the, the visceralness of prejudices like that. You know, of course, 21 years of war on terror inflected Islamophobia, um, you know, the deep misogyny and anti-feminism that is so endemic to our society. Um, they take these things and they say, these prejudices you hold are right and just and good. These are natural things. And the people who are struggling against them, people fighting for trans rights, people fighting for, uh, people fighting for women's rights, people fighting for racial equality, people you know, um, who are fighting you know, for Muslims to be accepted in American society are, not only are they acting in an unnatural way, they're taking away from you. They're trying to subvert your natural healthy instincts. So it becomes then this sort of rhetorical jujitsu of your being victimized. Our natural instincts are being subverted by powerful forces 
and you are being victimized by a culture that wants to take away these natural and even protective prejudices. So that's what I would describe as like the first kind of slide down the slide. Once you're in this mode where you're like, you know, I'm victimized. And then the second step is fight back. And so once you're sort of inducted into the culture war, drafted as a warrior, that's where your desire to feel like you're part of something bigger or your desire to learn more or your desire to, you know, get rid of whatever loneliness or aimlessness you might feel and become part of a community of people who are fighting back against these nebulous forces, these victimizers, these subverters. You know, this is the seductive journey that people will go down and it can often be quite rapid um, and often start with commentators that are more or less socially accepted or milk toast, people like Jordan Peterson or Ben Shapiro. Uh, and it can progress very precipitately because these people know exactly what they're doing, which is starting people down a very dark road. In terms of this pathway, uh, you know, as two Jewish women speaking to each other, what role does anti-Semitism in particular play? And in this period from 2017 to 2021, have you seen any shifts in the way anti-Semitism is utilized uh, in your far right universes that you're exploring? Yeah, I mean, anti-Semitism is sort of an endlessly fascinating topic to me, not just because I have a personal stake in it, obviously, but also because it's such a slippery chameleon of a thing. And yet at the same time, it's always the same. Mm -hmm. um, it can appear in so many different guises, but at the end of the day, it's still the same old thing. Right? Um, I have a whole spiel on anti-Semitism. I won't probably go into the whole thing, but I'll say a couple of things. So anti-Semitism is the oldest prejudice, uh, the oldest conspiracy theory in the West. In, in some ways, it is, it's the OG conspiracy theory from which uh, all other conspiracy theories stem. So, uh, you know, in, in, in our culture. And similarly, if you scratch the surface of most conspiracy theories, even like flat earth, you know, you'll find anti-Semitism there. Um, but, you know, if you go back even as far, I mean, we've all been thinking about plagues a lot lately. And I, it's like, if you go back as far as the Black Death, I mean, now those were some of the worst pogroms in European history because it was spread across, um, a, 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 across the Christian world at the time that Jews had caused the plague by poisoning wells and that it was an international cabal and conspiracy to poison the wells in order to destroy the Christian populace and for Jews to become supreme. Um, so, you know, uh, that's as old as it goes and how little it's changed over, you know, the course of millennia. <clears throat> um, as to the role that, that anti-Semitism plays in the white supremacist ecosystem, um, it plays a couple of different roles. But essentially what it serves as is the intellectual scaffolding of the white power movement. You know, there are not overtly anti-Semitic portions of the far right. When it comes to white power groups, people who specifically are white supremacists, they're almost inevitably deeply, ferociously and obsessively anti-Semitic in ways that I think are a little bit difficult for people to understand who like don't, Get it. It's like, but aren't aren't Jews white? You know, um, I look we white. We both look very white. white. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and oh, gosh, I'm like trying to cram everything into a couple of sentences. And it's fine. It's all good. We're we're good. We're it's so it's the very like whiteness of Jews um, that white supremacists hate the most. They view Jews as subverting whiteness from within. Um, they view Jews as sort of agents of the enemy or like just simply enemies who are, you know, like Trojan horsing their way into whiteness uh, in order to destroy it from, from within. So, you know, that's one source of the vehemence. As far as the intellectual purpose that Jews serve. So you're a white supremacist, you have certain beliefs. You believe that the white race should be superior you believe that women uh, should be absolutely subservient to men. Uh, you believe that 
uh, gay people should be punished with death. Uh, you know, these are well within the constellation of beliefs that, you know, members of the white power movement hold. Um, and so you have this abiding question. Why do people believe differently than me? Why do people believe uh, differently than these beliefs that I believe to be self-evident, natural, that I believe so fervently? And the answer is very convenient. It's the Jews. <laughs> Um, you know, Jews are like a deus ex machina in, in so many of these spaces. It's just like the reason why something you don't like happened is because mm -hmm. of the Jews. Um, and usually in order to subvert or destroy white fertility. So that's why we have trans rights. That's why we have feminism. That's why we have gay rights. That's why we have racial, you know, pushes for racial equality. Uh, all of these are Jewish blocks. Um, and these ideas go back, you know, just in the United States, at least as far as Henry Ford, um, who was from not too far from you guys um, in the upper Midwest. Uh, and, um, but, uh, you know, and, and his promulgation of a series called The International Jew, which he then handed out at Ford dealerships all over the country. Um, and, you know, some, some of it has aged poorly, like Jews are responsible for the national plague of jazz. Um, but, you know, which is by the way, why there are square dances at so many public schools, mm -hmm. because Henry Ford uh, thought that this was a, a good combating of the pernicious Jewish influence of jazz. But anyway, um, just a fun anti-Semitism fact for you. Uh, but, um, like, um, the other thing is like the way anti-Semitism and racism are very deeply intertwined. They're joined at the hip. So you showed me, Ellie, um, the report this year about anti-Semitic incidents uh, in Milwaukee. In, in Wisconsin. Uh, in, in Wisconsin, more broadly, sorry. Um, and I read it pretty attentively. It, it's represented a significant uptick. Um, you know, to answer the second part of your question, we live in a society a time that's very permissive to hate, um, where many people have been politically radicalized over the past, you know, seven years uh, in many different ways. Um, and this is a particularly, like the gates are very, the floodgates are very much open in, in ways there weren't, you know, six or seven years ago. And, and consequently, uh, anti-Semitic incidents have tripled, you know, doubled, tripled all over the country, um, you know, uh, Wisconsin not not uh, accepted. What I noticed about many of the entries that you told me, the examples that were in this report, is that they sought to blame Jews for anti-racism. And they used the occasion of Black Lives Matter protests to engage in overt anti-Semitism. How does this make any sense? I mean, what, like, so there's this idea that Jews invented the concept of anti-racism, uh, the Jews invented the concept of racism, uh, you know, in order to subvert the natural supremacy of the white race uh, so that, you know, Jews could ultimately rule. Um, conspiracy theories that Jews are behind pushes for racial justice date back in the United States to the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, um, and particularly at a fever pitch during the civil rights movement. Um, this idea that it was a communist Jewish plot mm -hmm. for black people to want civil rights. It, it serves sort of a dual rhetorical purpose. One, it denigrates the intelligence, drive and ambition of people of color who seek betterment for themselves and justice by saying, oh, you must have a puppeteer, a puppeteer who looks white. Um, and two, it again, conveniently, <laughs> says like, oh, you know, what we believe in the, you know, the racial inferiority of black people is the natural order. It's only subverted by these terrible Jews. And I would say the second role that anti-Semitism plays in addition to providing this sort of bete noir, this deus ex machina explanatory fact for everything that they dislike in this world um, up to and including immigration, uh, you know, like every social, more they'd like to see overturned and, and dragged back into the stone ages. Um, but also, um, 
you know, very few people wake up in the morning and say, I'm powerful, I'm privileged, I, you know, I exist relative to the rest of society in a position where I'm not judged by the color of my skin. And I'm going to use this power to oppress people. You know, that may be de facto what they're doing, especially when white supremacists carry out their campaigns of harassment, both in terms of, you know, well-known incidents of street violence uh, and uh, incidents of, of terror and incidents of, uh, uh, you know, then online harassment as well. Very few, few people wake up and say, you know, and certainly there's a natural, uh, there's a level of cruelty in some of these people that they enjoy, you know, engaging in power. There's a desire to fight and a desire for violence. But nonetheless, naturally, there's a desire to have that feeling justified, mm. feel that they're acting in a just cause. And here's where, again, the sort of all powerful, malicious, cunning, uh, infinitely resourceful, infinitely wealthy, infinitely malevolent figure of the Jew comes in awfully handy. We're not, you know, in this scenario, we white supremacists are not, you know, white people generally doing okay and kind of on the top of the totem pole, you know, give or take class inequality, right? Um, like what we are is people who are under the heel of the terrible Jew. Mm. Um, so it, it's again, this rhetorical jujitsu of like, transforming yourself into a victim so that you can strike back doubly hard. And then creating a new power structure, creating something that's so pernicious. I think that's the thing that comes across in the Charlottesville uh, uh, protest when you hear Jews will not replace us. And I, as a Jewish person say, numerically, we cannot replace anyone. There are very few Jews in the world. <laughs> and then at the underlying tone there, it's not Jews will not replace us. It's not about us, it's about these threats that they see in terms of immigrants and people of color and gay people and all of those, that's, that's the replacement that, that is the seat of the fear and the Jews are pulling the strings of that potential replacement. Exactly, that yeah, the, the, the term, the great replacement, which is what those chants were directly referencing, uh, comes from a novel by the French novelist Renaud Camus, wrote Les Grands Replacements, which was not explicitly anti-Semitic, but was a, an explicitly racist uh, novel envisioning a, an apocalyptic future in which Europe was overrun by people of color who had immigrated. Um, now the great replacement theory exists in a lot of different forms, many of which are explicitly anti-Semitic. And, uh, and moreover, great replacement theory, the idea that white people are being actively replaced by the machinations of evil, e either the global elite, mm -hmm. unspecified or Jews specified, uh, you know, through immigration, through, uh, you know, Jews encouraging intermarriage, through, uh, you know, higher birth rates of people of color, um, the idea that white people are being replaced and, and you know, the companion uh, phrase is white genocide. Although, you know, genocide traditionally involves some measure of like violence <laughs> or, you know, literally anything provable. Um, so there is no white genocide currently happening. But it's this idea that like people immigrating and birth rate disparities form in and of themselves a genocide. Um, so these are two basic names for this idea. Um, this paranoia, this fear is so deeply rooted that it's been the direct cause of some of the most infamous massacres in recent years, including the Christchurch New Zealand massacre where 51 Muslims were killed, including the Tree of Life synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh which um, was directly related to that synagogue hosting a Sabbath uh, welcoming refugees. So, you know, this is really sinister ideation and there are certain uh, late night hosts like Tucker Carlson who have danced very close and even at times overtly embraced replacement theory uh, without, you know, to use a Nazi phrase, naming the Jew. Um, but nonetheless danced very, very, very close to this line, uh, this line that has caused so much violence, um, you know, such an incendiary and, and violent idea. You took us into Wisconsin, so I'm gonna extend this a little bit further. We in the past year have seen a little bit of this militia. It's become more to the fore, especially we're about a year in the year anniversary from 
uh, the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, and we saw this big militia response over state lines, lots of people coming into, into the state, including a young man, Kyle Rittenhouse, who ends up uh, killing two of the protesters who were there. Marchamo. And so could you talk a little bit about how this part of the process is set up, what these militias do, and, and anything that you can kind of inform us around the Wisconsin story here, what's what's unique and what's totally common? Um, yeah, um, I'll do a very quick primer on militias. Um, one thing I've written about at some length is uh, the ways in which militias draw in veterans, particularly. Um, you may have noticed that in the, uh, you know, there's there have been news reports and this has borne out that there was a, you know, um, a disproportionate number of uh, um, military veterans, um, of active duty military, and of uh, law enforcement officers were involved in that event. Um, and, you know, there were also several militias present, including the three percenters and the Oath Keepers, were sort of the largest national militias. Um, and this is not a coincidence. Um, so, I mean, part of it comes down to the way our society treats veterans, which is not particularly well. Um, many veterans return from their tours of duty, um, suffering various physical and psychological ailments. Many feel completely abandoned and many feel a combination of feelings I've mentioned before, which is loss, aimlessness, and wanting to belong to a cause. So militia groups, which rose to prominence in the United States in the 1990s, uh, 80s and 90s, um, explicitly take a military position. They explicitly have commanders and ranks. They do field training exercises. They pr pr particularly sort of parrot the military in their structure. And in addition to that, they also parrot the military in the way that they claim to be pretend protecting and defending the country. Of course, this is a very specific vision of the country and a very specific uh, Americana. Um, and when they talk about the constitution, which many do, many of these militia groups describe themselves as sort of constitutional militias, talk about you know, the clause in the constitution um, that uses the word militia, although you know, most constitutional scholars talk about that being the US having a standing army <laughs> or a national guard, uh, not so much uh, paramilitary groups, but we have an awful lot of those too. Um, you know, they exploit people's desire to serve something larger than themselves. Say, this is how you serve your country by being battle ready. And, uh, you know, with Rittenhouse, this is clearly someone who was enamored of militia aesthetics, shall we say, and of gun culture. Um, and this is clearly someone willing to engage in murder. Um, what's been particularly interesting, I mean, of course that case, the, the case is deeply tragic. Uh, what's been particularly interesting is the way Rittenhouse has become a cause celeb on the far right. So there's a Christian fundraising site, Give, Send, Go, that I, I interviewed the founders at some length piece for the nation. And I have to tell you, it, it, it really strained all of my journalistic ability to keep a smile on my face while listening to hateful things to talk to them about, you know, why they, they specifically with their, you know, Christian site with the cross waving were so eager to support people from, you know, January 6th defendants to the Proud Boys to Kyle Rittenhouse raise half a million dollars on that scale alone. Um, there was a data breach of the site because frankly it's poorly designed and poorly protected. Um, which revealed law enforcement officers from all around the state um, who had donated to his defense and considered them, considered him one of us. So um, certainly there is a law enforcement and militia overlap. Certainly there have been countless instances where law enforcement and militias, first of all, not only do militias see themselves as sort of auxiliary to law enforcement, uh, only, to, you know, that, that, that they'll only turn against state tyranny if they have to. You know, certainly we saw that on, on January 6th. Um, 
but for the most part, cops and militias get along really, really well um, and see themselves on the same team. It's a mutual affection. Um, and this is definitely demonstrated by the support for Rittenhouse, uh, as well as countless other proofs. And, and, you know, certainly this is unsettling if you want to sort of continue to believe in the myth of the apolitical law enforcement officer, but the fact is that law enforcement in the United States is explicitly political, explicitly aligned with political parties. And uh, in the United States, it is quite far and often radically right wing to the point of being aligned with militia groups to the point of, you know, uh, denying the 2020 election uh, result, et cetera, et cetera. So there is an unfortunate politicization of law enforcement, um, which redounds, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, in the communities that they're meant to protect and serve. Um, and the other piece about militias, I mean, this is this is just sort of a a little anecdote, um, but just about what the last, you know what life was like for militia members around the election and, and January 6th. So I um, was part of a group briefly called the Platform Hate that was working on reducing violence around the election, doing some digital interruption work and, and all, all kinds of things. And, and uh, among the things I did for that group was uh, join the Zello channel. So Zello is like a walkie talkie app where you push to talk, um, but I joined this um, militia called the Georgia 3% Security Force. I did an hour long voice interview and then I was in uh, and I listened to all of their communications, you know, as much of their communications as I could for about three months uh, until literally a, like 10 days before January 6th when I got booted out of the chat for being new um, in essence because um, they'd had some other infiltrators than me. Uh, but you know, it was fascinating to hear the welter of conspiracy theories, the sort of martial flag draped patriotism and consistent antipathy for racial justice groups, uh, you know, full embrace of the most paranoid elements of conservative media and immediate denial of the 2020 election results uh, that only became more florid and more insistent and more militant uh, as time went on. And so I think we're, each, we're in an interesting period for the far right, um, you know, both after Charlottesville and after January 6th, you see this sort of moment where, because they've become visible, uh, many participants are arrested. Um, there's this sort of de facto attempt by federal and local authorities to seem as though they're like ready to distribute justice to the groups. But of course, behind the scenes, they're regrouping um, the sentiments of not that way. And as we know, conspiracy thrives in opposition. So in this moment of, as it were, political exile, these sentiments are renewed and like a caged tiger, they're ready to spring. So you describe some of the things that you did to combat online hatred, you know, in terms of infiltrating these groups and uh, really getting in there and trying and, and following the chatter and all of these pieces. For those of us without that kind of s stamina, stomach, uh, backbone, I mean, just that, because you are opening yourself up to a whole world of potential harassment in a number of different ways. What are things that individuals can do in terms of, is there anything that you feel is like, the responsibility of our attendees and myself and the library today and taking this on? Um, yeah, I mean, I will say this, that like I am a journalist who does things under my own name. That's not necessarily what most folks who are like combating these groups do. Um, most people operate a lot more anonymously and in collectives you know, for self-protection because these people will try to fuck up your life and they have tried to fuck up mine. Um, you know, I've had visits from the FBI, <laughs> victim updates about various threats. Um, I've had my parents' address leaked. I don't vote where I live 
you know, I'm still registered in a different borough because voter records are easy to leak and get public in New York. Um, so, you know, I never posted Instagram from, or a photo from where I currently am. Um, I, I do not post photos of my family members. I'm not friends with any of my family members on social media. And I use a service that erases my address and those of every member of the family, immediate family uh, from the internet um, as well as phone number. And um, those are a few of the precautions that I take my day-to-day -day. and I understand that not everyone wants to fall under such a thing. I will say it is impossible to vocally oppose white supremacy without getting a certain level of smoke and a certain level of opposition. And if you are not in the business of receiving opposition or being able to cope with a certain level of stridency in that opposition, then uh, this may not be for you. That being said, I think it's a worthwhile cause uh, and it's worth taking a certain level of heat um, in order to stand up against these forces. Um, I would say this, I would say start local, you know, start in your town, start where you are. You know, who's that person that you know that's posting racist stuff, if you know someone like that? Where are they getting their ideas? Um, are they part of any groups? Is there an militia in your town? Who are its members? Are they on school boards? You know, look up the mem the elected officials in your town, in your district, you know, your state, your 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 um neighborhood board or whatever. Because this is where very often white supremacists want to slip in through the cracks mm -hmm. um, to gain power, however small. You know, check out those people who who have power in your area um, and see what you find and don't be afraid, publish it when you do, even if you have to do so anonymously, that's okay. Um, the other thing I would say is like, look, at, look for extant anti-racist groups in your area and anti-fascist groups in your area. Um, these things exist. You don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. And the other thing is that like, you know, uh, I'm gonna actually read a quote. This is from um, an advice column that I read sometimes, Dear Prudence from Slate. But it was just such a great answer that I, I thought I would uh, like incorporate it in some of my talks because, I mean, the letter writer had a question about sort of coworkers were, were being racist. And um, gosh, hang on one second. I have it. Uh, let me find it. And then after this, we're opening up to questions from the audience. Joan, you're going to be on deck first. I've seen in the Q&A that in the chat, you're there. But for anybody else, please throw it into chat or into Q&A. And we'll make sure that Talia sees it. Um, and we'd love to hear what you're thinking. Um, yeah, so here's just the, the paragraph it's by Danny Lavery. Racism merits engagement. Context is key. It may not be the best use of your time to engage a stranger online who's clearly uninterested in having a genuine conversation about their own racism. You may have reasons to fear for your own safety, et cetera. But hell yes, racism in others, in ourselves, in national and local institutions, in history, in policy, in medicine, in sex and romance, in our families, merits engagement. Racism merits disavowal. Racism merits rejection. Racism does not deserve silence if one is situated to speak. Racism asks for tacit approval, for uneasy silence, for half-hearted chuckles, for the challenge to go unmet. It does not deserve any of those things. Um, I'd also add that there's all too often a, a, a tendency to make racism in, in America, to make racism about like what you personally feel. And it's much more so, you know, a systemic thing um, that operates in that on every possible level and what lies in your heart or whether you have a racist bone in your body. And mine is my ulna and I'm working on getting it removed. Uh, you know, the, this is besides the point. It's like when you see the concrete uh, consequences of racist policy, when you see racist action, it is your duty as a human being uh, to um, combat it as loudly as you can.
and try not to be afraid because it's worth it. This is actually a perfect segue to Joan's question. Joan, do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask? Thank you so much. Um, this discussion has been, again, another riveting um, conversation. Uh, it's so important to bring these um, questions um, to, you know, to the surface and, and, and hear someone who is as studied um, as Talia is um, respond to these questions and help us understand better based on all of these years of research that you've been doing and, um, you know, really putting yourself, um, you know, in some cases potentially harm's way. And I just can't tell you how much I appreciate this work that you're doing. And so with regard to that work, um, Talia, I'm wondering if, is there any possibility in your future as part of this that you would spend time with those supremacists that have reformed themselves um, and to understand their experiences that led them to, um, you know, get to a point where they could could see a way out of the darkness and 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 truly reform um, um, sort of sort of change their hearts and minds and um, begin to work um, um, alongside others who are working um, towards you know or on behalf of anti-racism so just wondering if that's ever something you you know if that's something that you would consider or um, maybe you have done it in the past <laughs> yeah i mean there there are some formers as they call themselves uh former white supremacists who you know certainly have spent a lot of time atoning for their past including publicly um there are others who maybe claim to be formers but are not quite as distant from their pasts as they can be um I think there are individual stories of de-radicalization that are great and inspiring. Um, you know, but what I always come back to, so there are two stories of de-radicalization in particular that have struck me. Uh, one is the story of Megan Phelps Roper, who was a member of the Westboro Baptist Church, the infamous sort of uh, church that would picket military funerals. Their sign said, God, God hates bags, uh, et cetera. She was unfortunately born into that family. Um, you know, it's a family affair. And the way she was de-radicalized is because she ran the church's Twitter account and then had a Twitter account of her own and began to correspond with a man who wanted to essentially draw her out. And they spoke for years and wound up getting married. And the other story is uh, documented in Eli Saslow's book, uh, rising out of hatred, which is the story of uh, Derek Black, the, our Derek Black, the son of the founder of sort of oldest and biggest neo-Nazi website online, Stormfront, which is associated with about a hundred murders. The godson of David Duke, who um, went to college, Florida Atlantic University, a small liberal arts school. Um, he was running a white supremacist radio show while being a student, you know, isolated. It was a multiracial case. And he got outed by, a, you know, someone who put two and two together. Uh, and subsequently a Jewish student invited him to Shabbat dinners at his house, to which he came pretty faithfully for years, years. There was a group of them, and his friends who very, very, very slowly moved him away from the belief he had held so dearly his whole life. And what these two things tell me, anyway, is that de-radicalization is a very intimate process. It's a very, it involves a tremendous amount of time, of human resources. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to scale on a mass level. Um, and what's more, the recipient of the, the de-radicalizee the person who would leave these communities has to be ready to receive that kind of care and attention, which, you know, if you haven't gotten all that you're going to get from hate, 
maybe you're not. So I tend to be a little skeptical of this idea of peace and dialogue and, uh, you know, just talk to these folks. I have a much more militant approach. My thought about what's like a scalable societal solution, what's something we can opt into is not sort of a peaceful dialogue on the field of battle with people holding swastikas who want to kill me and, you know, kill people that look like, you know, different than them whose goals are dominance and violence. Um, because I don't think that sort of dialogue is productive. And I think it grants these people much more ideological uh, legitimacy um, than they are due. I think the broader social approach that I would endorse is one of complete censure, is one of complete, um, you know, if you know someone involved in one of these groups, if you know someone espousing these sentiments, cut them off remorselessly. Make these sentiments uh, egregious, make them ugly to yourself and others. Shun people who, who say these kinds of things. And if we all do that, then the social cost of hate becomes higher. And the higher we raise it, the fewer people will be willing to risk it. That's a theory, but I think it, might work better than the kumbaya approach. I, I, I thank you, Talia. Yeah, no, thank you, Talia. That I, I hope think that it, didn't come off as disrespectful. I, I really appreciate no. the question. I've heard many variants on it. I just, um, I just do have, you know, I think so many people want there to be like a wonderful, peaceful solution that doesn't require being really mean to Nazis, but you know, or why Nazis be really mean to them. And unfortunately, once someone's at the point where they're Nazi, it's, it's real hard for them to get out of it without really having consequences for their actions. Well, I so appreciate the opportunity to learn with you, to learn from you. Um, I will say, just as a plug, a local plug, if you're interested in understanding more about anti-Semitism in Milwaukee, our local Jewish Community Resource Center, they are the people who run the audit. I put the link in the chat, and they have a number of programs around anti-Semitism and dialogue, um, including one actually coming up about polarization, uh, which I'll put that link in the chat as well. Um, they're not my organization, the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee, but a separate one. Um, I don't know that we have any further questions and I think we're just about at time, but are there, as we're kind of wrapping up, um, do you want to tell us what you're working on now? Because I know that you're still in this, you're not somebody who just finished this universe and you're like, I need to get out of the darkness and I'm ready to go talk about puppies or unicorns. So what what's on your docket at this moment? Oh, believe me, the third, the third book I write is going to be about soup. Like I, <laughs> this is my last hurrah, but I am writing, uh, I am currently working on, or about to start uh, writing my second book, which will be called Lone Wolves Come in Packs or Lone Wolves Run in Packs. I don't know. What do you think is better? I like run. Yeah. Lone Wolves Run in Packs, a little punchier. Uh, but at any rate, it's sort of a refutation of this idea of the lone wolf, which is something you hear often, um, you know, like like a Kyle Rittenhouse or, you know, the man who engaged in that awful shooting at a Sikh Gurdwara um, in Wisconsin eight years ago, that these people are lone wolves, that they self-radicalize. Um, whereas what I want to demonstrate is that <clears throat> they're part of communities they arise from specific geographies, from religious environments, from political environments that uh, empower and, and are creatives of it. And so uh, the book will be a lot less gonzo and personal and, you know, sort of have all the first book flourish, not have all the first book flourishes and, and an autobiography that the first book did. It will be a lot more historical. Hopefully I'll be doing some reporting trips to some pretty hair raising places. Uh, and I'm excited to spend the next two years writing more about Nazis. I'm excited to read that book. I'm also excited to read your, your third book about soup. I think. Yes. Book. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> that'll be great. Think, too. No, that'll be my, I think the second book will be sort of my last hurrah in this field because it does tire you out after a while. You know, you spend all this time reading 
hate book, hate speech, hate whatever. Uh, and it begins to feel like life is this airless room. But, you know, you have to keep your feet on the ground and engage with things and people you love. Um, uh, hopefully I'll do a bit better this time around with that part of things. But thank you so much for having me. And Ellie, what a lovely conversation. Joan, thank you for your introduction. And um, uh, Brett, thank you so much for inviting me. And, and um, I really hope to see you guys if I'm ever in the walk. We'll have to make that happen. It's a great place to live and visit. Um, yeah. Thank you. And thank you to the library for putting this on. Uh, have a great night, everyone. My pleasure. Stay